So you would expect less species here than here. Um, and this area, this, this uh, uh, smaller area on top is simultaneously correlated with the fact that the top of the mountain is more isolated from everywhere else than the bottom. So when you look at a single mountain, you actually see multiple ecological processes affecting species richness along this mountain range. And the most famous and the most studied one is the latitudinal gradient in species richness. And here I bring for you an example with the uh, species richness of birds. Oh, and oh, there's Mexican birds in there. <laughs> there is Mexican birds here. <laughs> yeah, sorry, it, it's a species richness of birds here. Um, so richness, species richness, tend to decrease with latitude. The more you go far away from the equator, the less species you find. And this, you can, you, can, you can actually see this pattern in, in the fossil record, and it dates back to 200 million years. So it's not something new. In fact, uh, continent drift has moved around continents on, on surface of Earth, and every time a continent moves away from this from this uh, line, from the equator, species richness tend to decrease in that continent. There are very few exceptions to this pattern. Of course, there are groups of species that are specialized in, um, in temperate climates. There are, but these are very, the, Compared to the number of species we know, these are definitely exceptions. When you, when you uh, lump a large group of species and map the, the species richness in space, you usually find patterns that look like this. So you will find a, a concentration of species in tropical areas. The equator is around here. And you will see a decrease in species richness towards higher latitudes. And of course, you cannot simplify this pattern, saying that uh, there's only a decrease or an increase in species richness going northwards or southwards. There's also uh, the, the print of several other geological uh, uh, features in the, in the map of species richness. For example, here you see this very large mountain chain uh, in South America that's called the Andes. <laughs> and for some reason, birds tend to like the slopes of the Andes. And you will see uh, very high species richness here in uh, uh, Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia. And also, anyone know what this is? What, what this line here is? That's the Amazon River. It's not a stream. It's a pretty big river. It's larger than the Nile. But shorter. But shorter. <laughs> and in, I've been there once, and there are several uh, sites along this river in which when you are in a boat, you actually don't see land around. And that's how large it is. Like you can look in all directions and you won't see it really looks like an ocean. 
And several bird species, they have troubles crossing this stream. So you act, uh, this geological uh, feature actually separates biotas and has probably affected speciation in the past so that you can actually find groups of species that live in only one side and not the other one. And of course, this river uh, gets water from several other rivers because this, is, this river drains the entire basin. So there are lots of more species around, uh, groups of species around here, and they are affected by, this, by, by the river system. So, latitudinal gradients are very conspicuous, but um, you, we also have to take into account that species richness varies not only north and south, but also has the imprint of the geological uh, feature of the, the region. Oops. This is the map of uh, mammal species richness, and that's a global map. And here we can also see uh, some geological features of the planet. Uh, we can see major uh, deserts. We, we can see uh, the effects of islands. So. Madagascar has less species than Africa. Uh, Australia has less species than, uh, than the continent, the rest of the continent. But we can clearly see that there is a latitudinal gradient in species richness. Um, especially when we look at extreme north and extreme south, uh, you can see that these regions are usually species poorer than the tropics. And that's the map of species richness of birds globally. And when we look at this map and this resolution, we do see lots of the geological features uh, of the planet. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, I just I, I have a question with regards to these special richness patterns. What of the issue of anthropogenic activities? Where will you fix it in these five patterns you dis you discussed? The effect of human activity, mm -hmm. for example, where you have much agriculture the land cover will have been reduced and then it may affect the species richness or so on. All right. So how humans affect the, the, pattern, the species richness yes. patterns? Anthropogenic effects. Right. Um, humans have a, a enormous potential to affect species richness in a given locality. However, the patterns I'm showing you and how we will approach these patterns today uh, is from the historical perspective. We are, we are assuming that we have the data before the humans starting affecting them. So we are looking at these maps and we're gonna think of no humans have affected species richness. And of course this is not true. If we have the actual map of species richness today, it's probably gonna look a little different than this one. Uh, but because today we are interested in the causes of biodiversity, for this exercise we're going to have to take humans to the side and pretend we know the exact historical distribution of species. Okay? Yes? And when it is an ecological island, can we know the factor which influence the dynamics of a species? 
uh, when it's an ecological island? Yes. Uh, Islam. Uh, okay, okay, yes. island. Uh, when it's an ecological island, yes. uh, can we know what? The factor which uh, influences the dynamics of a species. Uh, so, I think, I think you need to uh, expand a little in what you, what you call an ecological island. Do you mean a real island? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, if we could figure out what, what are the causes of species richness in that particular island? Well, um, we can study it. We can come up with hypotheses for it. Uh, for example, we can measure the distance to the mainland. Uh, we can evaluate how many uh, is how many speciation and extinction events have uh, happened in that particular island. Um, and some people have even uh, run experiments by, uh, by setting up, by removing entire biotas from small islands and see how it's colonized. But it's very hard to figure out that for every single species. Uh, but in general, we tend to, um, to assume that the further the island is from the continent, the less migrants it's going to receive. Um, and the larger the island is, the more species it can harbor. Did I answer your question? Yes. <clears throat> All right, so now we ask a not simple question. What are the drivers of these patterns? What are the causes? Uh, how are they affected? How are they ma maintained? Well, in this uh, conceptual map, we, we have to uh, separate processes that, that happen in the local scale and these processes usually affect what are the species you find in a single site. And we have a different group of causes or, or drivers. And these, uh, the, the second group of, of drivers, are actually affecting the species that live in your region, that live in a given region or in a given continent. So in a much larger scale. So when we split these two potential causes of species richness, we can now think that uh, processes that affect local species richness, or at least the most common ones, are the interaction between the species in that particular site. So suppose one particular species has a predator and uh, that predator is gone, it's just overkilled. And then there's this boom uh, in population for that particular species, and it's going to consume all resources, and then both predator and prey is gone. So this is, you, and then you're not going to find a species in that particular place. And it's, it's potentially the cause of a local extinction. So this interaction between uh, species, or, or like for example, a, a disease that, uh, that is affecting a given species in a given site, and which may also uh, promote local extinction. So this interaction between species in a given, in a particular place, uh, may be the cause of the number of species you find in, in that particular place. Um, of course, species may actually uh, help each other, and that we call the mutualism. So when there is this very strong mutualism between species, you may actually not find uh, a given species if you cannot find, or if the, another species is not present. Uh, so this interaction between species tend to affect species richness in this local scale. And of course, 
there is also a stochastic extinction, uh, which is very common in the tropics. Uh, for example, you can't predict, but maybe next year there's a, like a huge hurricane that vanishes an entire small population of something. So the, the disturbance in a given site may affect the number of species you find in a given time. So, so you can never ask uh, or answer the question of how many species there are or what are the causes of a species richness in a given site without thinking locally. But, you know, whatever happens locally must be related to whatever happens regionally because uh, the species must get there in a given site first or if it's excluded from that particular site uh, there may be a site nearby where the same species uh, is still present and may recolonize. So migration and habitat filtering is a very, are very important processes that affect the number of species you find in a given place. Because uh, if the regional pool of species is, uh, is, is still it still represents that particular group of species, this recolonization process may certainly affect the number of species you find in a given site. But what affects the pool of regional species richness? Well, we can think of speciation first. Um, uh, so, the, the, when, when the species, when a species become two, uh, when there is an speciation event, uh, the number of species in the regional pool increases, and this new species can also can now recolonize the area, and its number of species goes up. Of course. Extinction affects the regional pool of species in the other direction. So when one species is, goes extinct uh, from the regional pool, or, or go literal, literally extinct, then of course it affects the local species richness, because you are now not counting that species anywhere else. And uh, biotic interchange uh, which is the interchange of species pool, species pools uh, between regions or, or large regions. Uh, and this is a very uh, um, rare event when there's long distance migration. Um, for example, um, million, years, uh, million years ago, uh, there was this split between South America and Africa. And since that time, a couple of species could actually make all their way and, and recolonize uh, the other continent. And, and this biotic interchange increases the species richness regionally, but also locally. So, in order to understand the patterns we're going to study today, we have to have this conceptual map in mind. We cannot look at a given site, a given mountain, without thinking on how structured eco ecological processes are. And they are structured in space, and they are structured in time. So speciation and biotic interchange will increase regional uh, pool of species. Extinction is going to decrease. And whatever the regional pool is, migration and habitat filtering will affect local, the local pool of species or, or the local species richness. Um, and here, competitive exclusion, predatory exclusion, stochastic extinction, just to mention a few, will affect 
uh, number of species you find locally. Okay, now I'm going to uh, spend a couple more minutes talking about a couple factors that affect regional species richness. And these factors are area, topography, temperature, climatic stability, and then uh, climatic factors, energy and productivity. 